Tonight we're talking about this subject, Israel and Palestine, the conflict. What is the biblical truth? I want you to leave your comments as to how you see this particular scenario unfolding. There are many of the younger generation, for example, that are looking at it more from a humanitarian perspective instead of a biblical perspective. I'm not saying they don't have good intentions, but I'm saying you need to check out the biblical truth about this conflict going on. Maybe some of you are not aware of it. And I'd like to leave, if you would, please leave your comments as to what you see in the overall point of view or purpose of this particular conflict and what is the biblical truth. Now, I would like to encourage you to grab your pencil and pen and piece of paper as we just jot down a few questions that I've been praying about today as to the conflict. There'd be the first one was when. When did this particular conflict began? Next, we'll ask the question where. And then thirdly, the question will be why. And then finally, what? What should we do about it? The Palestinian slash Israeli conflict. You do know that the term Palestinian was coined in 135 by Hadrian and the Roman emperor, and thus the term was not original even from a biblical standpoint. At least that's what we're being told. But rather than go from the historical point of view, I want to go from a biblical point of view. When did this conflict start? And of course, if you've studied your Bible, you know well, well aware of the fact that this conflict started when Esau and Jacob were born, and Esau, being the older, was to serve the younger, according to the word of the Lord, to the mother, Rebekah. Now, even before then, you can see the descendants of Abraham. God called a Gentile, Abram, out of the or the Chaldees from a pagan background and made a covenant slash unconditional with Abraham and told him that he would become a great nation, which we call the Jewish people or the nation of Israel. And consequently, he had a boy named Isaac. However, after the promise, at the age of 75, 25 years transpired without the promised child, namely Isaac, the boy that would carry to be the heir of the Israeli people. But to speed up the process, uh, Abraham tried to uh, speed up the process, I might say, and had a baby with his maid, which turned out to be Hagar the maid and Ishmael the child. Now you've got the descendants of Ishmael, which are today in modern day Saudi Arabia and others the, who practice the religion of Islam, and you've got Isaac's descendants, which be the Israeli Jews. So we go all the way back to the bad blood between the brothers, Ishmael and Isaac, as well as Esau and Jacob. Let's go further in our study. Not only when does this take place, but where does this take place? If you go from a biblical standpoint, we're talking about some date 6,000 years ago, some say 4,000, some even 10,000. I would not lean too heavily on the older earth, uh, yet... You find these references to God's promises to his people, namely in the book of Leviticus, Moses is the author, and the Lord said to his people, uh, he said, the land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. And so God said, I want to give you this land, and so it's important that we understand now, even from a diplomatic, governmental perspective, even in America, as our president and the cabinet are in trying to enforce and push the two-state solution. Although, if you look at the 1967 war and the 73 war, and where Israel became a nation in 1948, you find some of the history as to God gave them this land way back there in the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, verse 23. And I'll tell you where he gave it. He gave it all the way from the uh, river of the Egypt Nile all the way to the Euphrates River. Listen to the scripture according to Genesis chapter 15 and verse 18. And that same day, this is when God made a covenant 
with Abram, put him to sleep, and proved that it was unconditional, although the obedience would be indicative of chastisement of God. It didn't negate the unconditional promise that God had for Abraham. Out of his seed would come a great nation, and he would be the heir of the Savior of the world, the Lord Jesus Christ. In addition to the unconditional covenant that God made with Abraham, it, the Abrahamic covenant we call the Davidic covenant, which is with David. I'll spare you the information there other than we look to the millennial reign, which will be the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. Wrong. Here's this land covenant, the land covenant. Listen to this. In that same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. My question is, when have they ever possessed this land? I'll come back to this in a moment, but I want to show you a picture of that. When have they ever possessed this land? From the river Nile all the way to the river Euphrates. The answer is never. Now, if you take the Bible literally, like I take the Bible literally, from a historical, grammatical, contextual perspective, then we must conclude that either God was saying that or he was just not really saying it to mean it. We call that other interpretation allegorical. Well, I propose to you and submit to you that it's a literal rendering. The God promised, we take the Bible literally, the old saying is when the plain sense of Scripture makes common sense, then make no other sense. Now, it is true that the Bible uses what we call apocalyptic literature, which uses symbols to convey truth. But the key to interpreting apocalyptic literature is to use the Scripture. It will be the interpreter. Now, I don't have time to go into that. You can look at some of our videos in the matter of what we call hermeneutics, interpretation. The point is this. God promised them the land. They hadn't possessed it as of yet. God promised them the land. And so the Palestinians uh, now are fighting over the land. In fact, they're not satisfied with even this uh, proposal of the West Bank or just having a sparse portion of the land. And you can look at Hamas, and I say the Palestinians, these terroristic groups who are operating out of Gaza, and even Hezbollah, Fatah, and these groups are not satisfied with just a little bit of land. They want to wipe Israel off the map and push them, quote, from the river to the sea. Now you see the conflict. Now, let me just say a word to the younger generation that has a passion for the underdog. You see the Palestinians, you see the war going on, and certainly we need to pray for the Palestinians as well as the Israelis that those who don't have a relationship with God would come to faith in Jesus Christ, and I hope you do as you're listening right now. But the younger generation not only needs to be in touch with their emotions, looking at the secular media as what's portrayed from a humanitarian point of view, but understand from a scriptural biblical Christian point of view, what does God say about it? And what does the word of the Lord predict as to the future, the past, the present, the future? And so this is our goal. And no disrespect, but I talk with a lot of young people, teenagers, and even young adults who don't understand the origin of God's promises to his people, Israel, and light of where the 1987, 1988, the starting of Hamas, this terroristic group, which makes no bones about it. Their intention is to kill Israelis and overtake them. And that's, of course, the, some of the teaching. So we go back to this particular question, when, and now we are talking about where. We're talking about in the Middle East, the conflict between Israel and the Palestinians, and more specifically, how this involves other nations as well. I read just today where the uh, president of Turkey, Erdogan, has said that he was going to get Netanyahu for uh, genocide and for criminal law, for defending after October the 7th, and thousands of Israelis were brutally murdered. You know, in comparison to the state of New Jersey, the size of Israel would be more than even our 9-11 here in America, the magnitude of that event. Now, there is a just war. Ecclesiastes, the writer Solomon said, there's a time for peace, there's a time for war. And thus God has 
indicated in his word. Now, so let's move further. Not only when is this conflict and where is the conflict, but let's go further as we look at where, not only where, but why is this conflict. And I just already mentioned to you some of the reasons for this conflict in the Middle East. And one of the reasons is the Temple Mount. This has been a power struggle from day one. But I want to remind you, according to the Bible, the scripture, we find out that David purchased the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. This is found in 2 Samuel chapter 24, I believe it is, as well as uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 3 verse 1 it describes the temple would be the place where the threshing floor was purchased. Solomon to build that temple, and as you know history, the uh, first temple built by Solomon was destroyed in 586 B.C. However, many of the Jews, which is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy, came back to their homeland. We call that Aliyahs, and thus the under Jerub, uh, Zerubbabel and Joshua, the book of Ezra, and more specifically the book of Zechariah describes him rebuilding the temple on the Temple Mount after it was destroyed. Mind you, it was not as enormous and magnificent as the Solomon's Temple. This is not the temple, by the way. This is the Gold Dome of the Rock, erected, I believe it was in 691. I'm not exactly sure about the date, but I believe that was the uh, date somewhere around that time after the destruction of the, the other temple in 70 AD when the Romans stormed in. But even after, or let me just say before 70 AD, Herod renovated Zerubbabel's temple, and thus it was standing there when the Romans destroyed it. Now, again, presently, you, the Alaska Mosque is the Muslim mosque on the Temple Mount, but there's not a temple standing as of today. But the, you can look at our videos in regards to the rebuilding of the temple. It will be rebuilt. It'll be, keep in mind, the Antichrist temple based on the book of Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, Revelation chapter 11, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. Paul said the Antichrist will sit at the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So I know there'll be a temple rebuilt. It's not as of now, but preparations have been made. But that's not going to be Messiah's temple. After the Antichrist temple, Messiah's temple will stand, otherwise known as Ezekiel's temple in Ezekiel chapter 40 through chapter 48. Now, listen, beloved, those of you that are watching, I appreciate you watching. I really do. I just finished preaching one of our dear, precious lady just about an hour ago, her funeral service, and my heart's a little heavy right now, and I know she's in heaven, but I'm going to miss her. And so I know I can't cover every base. Some of you make your comments. I read every one of them. I appreciate them. I really do. But when we're talking about a subject like Israel and Palestine, this would take hours to describe, and I know your listening span is like mine. It's sometimes very uh, challenged and uh, short, I might say. So what's, what is uh, not only why and when and where is this Israeli conflict, but last, let's talk about what. What does this mean? Where is this going to be leading in the future? And I just want to simply say that uh, this particular conflict is going to continue, but according to the book of Obadiah, as you can look at our videos concerning that, and the book of Ezekiel chapter uh, 35, that the Lord is going to deal with uh, the people who are anti-Semitic, and God is going to fulfill His word. Jesus Christ will come again, and what we call the snatching of the church, the bride of Christ. That is referenced in 1 Thessalonians 4. The Lord will descend from heaven with a shout. The voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those of us that are alive and remain caught up together on the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. I was just talking with our secretary about that very thing, about when we die, the spirit leaves the body, the body goes back to the dust. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, and yet the body will be resurrected at the rapture. And immediately we'll be rejoined with the Lord. So we immediately go in the presence of the Lord, those who have a relationship. Jesus said you must be born again. Paul said if you confess you with your mouth, the Lord Jesus, believe it your heart. God raised him from the dead. You can be saved. With the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You've been saved. I mean forgiven of your sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. Have you received him? 
do you know him? Not about him, but do you know him? And are you telling everybody else about him? See, God chose the Jewish people to not only fulfill his promise, one-third of the Bible is Bible prophecy, by the way, but he also chose the Jews to uh, compile this, what we call the Word of God, historically, archaeologically, prophetically, unparalleled when it comes to a document. Check out the Dead Sea Scrolls. Archaeological findings verify some of the things I'm sharing even today. And you can see that in regards to this conflict that's been going on, Israel and the Palestinians. And it will continue until the Lord says enough is enough. After the rapture, there's tribulation time, according to Daniel 9, 27, will take place. And this will fulfill these other wars that are going to culminate in the Isaiah 17, Damascus, Ezekiel chapter 38, 39, Psalm 83, and then ultimately the battle of Armageddon. Christ will come in his second coming. No man knows the hour. Only the Father in heaven. I love this verse. Be ready for you think not the hour. The Son of Man comes. Are you ready for the coming of the Lord? The question is, uh, whose side is God on? And I tell you, if the Word of God is all inspired, and it is, all scriptures give him inspiration of God, 2 Timothy 3.16, I want to be on God's side. I don't want God to just try to say, God, I want you to be on my side. I want to be on the Lord's side. Are you on the Lord's side? Are you telling others about the great love of God, God's forgiveness, hope in Him, help in Him? Many of you are struggling. Many of you are in conflict with your family. I've never seen a time where there's so much uh, conflict, it seems. Wars and rumors of wars with Russia and Ukraine and with China on the brink of invading Taiwan, Taiwan perhaps, and North Korea and these other nations that have joined in this uh, war with Israel, Iran, for example, and we'll see how much that will be involved, as well as Russia and Turkey and Syria and others. But let me close by saying and praying with you about this conflict. If you're not a Christian, there's certainly a conflict going between good and evil. Satan, the prince of darkness, and the Prince of Light, Jesus Christ, the peace of God. If there was a time we needed the peace of God, it's right now. Do you have the peace of God? Are you at peace now? There's so much going on now. My heart goes out to you, and I want to pray for you, and I want you to pray for me, and we'll pray for the Palestinians and the Israelis. God's word is being fulfilled. Thank you again for joining us. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you, Father, again for your blessed assurance, the security and identity and destiny we have with you. We're asking now for mercy and compassion as this war goes on in Israel. And Lord, the innocent people that are unfortunately getting caught in the crosshairs, and yet your word is clear on your stance on this. Help us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Lord, I know many of your people uh, and your due time will turn and trust in their Messiah, our Lord Jesus, when he comes again. So we pray now and bless you for those listening. I pray for uh, your peace that passes all understanding on our families and on our lives as we anticipate you coming one day in the clouds of heaven. Until then, be glorified, we pray now, as the lives are being changed in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, thank you. Appreciate you. God bless. Love you. God be with you till we meet again.